Professor Anthony Bryan from Leeds Beckett University is going to deliver his speech on grounded theory. Let me introduce him shortly first. Anthony Bryan is a professor of informatics at Leeds Beckett University, Leeds, UK. After completing a PhD on the new left, uh, new, new left in Britain at LSE, he lectured in sociology at the universities of Leeds and Durham before completing a Master of Science in Computing, then working in commercial software. He has written extensively on qualitative research methods, being senior editor of the Sage Handbook of Grounded Theory in 2007 and the Sage Handbook of Current Developments in Grounded Theory in 2019 both co-edited with Katie Chalmers. Other recent publications include Grounded Theory and Grounded Theorizing by Oxford Publication 2017, The Varieties of Grounded Theory by Sage Publications 2019, Digital and Other Virtualities, Renegotiating the Image, co-edited with Griselda Pollack, I.B. Torres, in 2010, Liquid Uncertainty, Chaos and Complexity, The Gig Economy and the Open Source Movement by Thesis 11, February 2020. Yes, Professor Bryant, now the microphone and the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm going to give a fairly brief overview of the grounded theory method. Uh, it's often called just grounded theory. It is a method, um, so just to avoid confusion, I tend to use the term grounded theory method or GTM. Um, and I will be sending the uh, um, conference organizers a copy of these slides so you will be able to have them for your own um, uh, reference. So I assume that you today are in this very wonderful conference with a, a, a wonderful program that's been sent to me, um, you're thinking about methods or you're working on a specific uh, project or proposal. Maybe you're even already using uh, grounded theory in some way, or you're interested in learn about, learning about it. Maybe all of them, uh, maybe something else entirely, but I hope that you will get uh, something from this next uh, hour and a half, hour and a quarter that I'll be, I'll be talking. Now, the first thing I have to say about grounded theory is that it's often seen by many research promoters, by editors, people who I call the gatekeepers of research committees, as a, a model of poor research practice. Um, and many years ago, I would come uh, across um, proposals for research where the students would say they wanted to use grounded theory, uh, and I was very suspicious. Um, their research proposal often had no clear research questions. It didn't pose hypotheses. They would say, we haven't done a literature review because that's what the people who set up the method of grounded theory recommend. Um, there would be claims that no previous relevant research exists. Um, and it was often seen by colleagues and myself at certain times as an excuse for not clarifying things early on. Um, and editors of journals still have this view when they see a grounded theory submission. They say, oh yes, grounded theory research has lots of codes in it, has long extracts from interviews. It doesn't actually have any actual theory. And that's led to this sort of question at the bottom there, where is the theory in grounded theory? And these things have, do occur, okay? On the other hand, over the years and with the work I've done and seen in my many PhD students who have used grounded theory and whose work I've come across when I've examined work um, for uh, other people's PhDs or looked at submissions to journals, is that actually, if you use it well, it's actually a model of good research practice. Um, and so I say to editors who tell me, oh, yes, I've got some very poor submissions of people who've used ground theory. And I always say to them, yes, and I'm sure you have lots of very poor submissions of people who use statistical methods or other qualitative methods. 
So don't, you know, state, say, oh, yes, it's a bad method because I've seen some poor uses of it. It applies to all methods. So actually, a grounded theory research proposal is often very good because it's open-ended. It's trying to explore something in its initial phase. It's aimed at developing novel insights, what is seen as a grounded theory. I'll talk briefly about that in a little while. It isn't just impressionistic. It actually offers a way of taking some data and then moving higher up to le higher levels of abstraction or conceptualization. Ideas which sort of capture the detail, but actually go beyond that detail. That's what a good grounded theory will do. There's a use of memos, not an initial part of grounded theory in the early writings, but now seen as a very important part. And some of my research students and other research students in who my colleagues supervise um, aren't using grounded theory, but they are using memos because it's a very good thing to, to use. And it encourages imaginative research. It actually says to students, do your own thing. Think up your own ideas. Don't be bound by what other people have already discovered. And a good research paper and a good PhD in grounded theory will actually move from all the details of hundreds sometimes of codes to two or three key concepts. And I'll explain some examples in a few minutes. Uh, it uses a very different set of ideas of sampling. Um, and it's important if you are going to use grounded theory or any other qualitative research, actually, that um, you make clear what form of sampling you're using. Because to a lot of people, particularly in the quantitative world, sampling means probabilities from statistical models. And you have to make it clear that's not what grounded theory sampling is about. There's this concept of theoretical saturation, quite a difficult term, but really it says to people, at what point can you say, I think I've done enough analysis and data gathering? And again, grounded theory makes you think that. A lot of other methods just say, Oh, you know, when you've got when n is a big enough number for your sample, you can stop. Okay, so it's a different way of thinking about it. And then it does a series of other things. It develops theoretical coding. It has this idea of substantive and formal grounded theories, which I'll talk about in a minute. And grounded theories are, are to be judged in many cases for their usefulness. In fact, Glazer and Strauss, who originated the, the term and, and in their research in the 60s, actually said, a lot of grounded theories become useful far more quickly than being proved by lots of people managing to replicate and validate and, and look at them. Okay. okay, so I've already mentioned this idea that it's not actually a theory. The theory is a thing you hope to come up with. It's actually a method. So I use the term grounded theory method or GTM. Um, it's the most widely used or claimed method in qualitative research, although, as I've said, some people who claim to use it are not really using it, or they're using it in a in a way which may be useful, but may not actually be grounded theory as far as many people are concerned. But we have to be a a, a big group who sees different ways of using the method. Um, and as I say here, many of the gatekeepers, reviewers, and so on, often say, "Oh, we don't like grounded theory research." And often it's because they don't actually understand it, but, uh, but that is changing slightly. But you do have to recognize that um, when you are putting forward a research proposal for a PhD or submitting a paper to a journal. It's increasingly being used across all areas of research. Initially, it was very much largely in medical and healthcare because of where Glazer and Strauss did their early work. But you'll see here it's being used in information systems. Um, there's a group in Auckland in New Zealand with there's some references there you can find. It's being used in humanities, art and design, cultural studies. Um, there are a huge range of people using the method in a range of different contexts. So where does it come from? Um, well, these are the two people who are associated readily with the term. Strauss there on the left. Um, he died in the 1990s. Barney Glazer. Um, who is in his 90s now, um, living in, in California, and a woman who always gets forgot, forgotten, or not when I do my presentations, because I always mention her. Uh, and this is a woman uh, on the left, you see her when she was a nurse in the University of California, San Francisco. She was then called Jean Quint. She then married Mr. Ben Oliel. So in her later years, as you see on the right, 
James Jean Quint Benolio and her nursing uh, experience uh, was really important. She worked with Glazer and Strauss on their early papers and she actually collected a lot of their data. Um, and her work was actually, she, she didn't, after that she'd worked with them in the 60s, she didn't write a huge amount on, on the method side, but she used the concepts which Glazer and Strauss and Benolio worked on in the 60s to develop the way in which people are nursed in, as it says here, end of life settings, or what's called terminal care, which really didn't exist before the 60s. Um, so she died in 2012 uh, and was a very important figure in the early days of the method and in nursing in, in America. And Glazer and Strauss came upon this method or developed this method for very personal reasons. Um, in the 60s, Strauss's mother had recently died and Glazer's father had recently died. Um, and their experience in being the son of a parent who goes into hospital and doesn't get better, but dies, um, sort of made them think what goes on in hospitals? Uh, at what point do people go into a hospital? And normally if you've been treated medically, the medical staff there say, oh, we'll do this and then you'll get better and we'll do this. And then at a certain point, certain people realize this isn't going to happen. You're not going to get better. You're going to, you're in an end of life situation. And they realize that different people have this awareness at different times. So the medical staff may have it before the patient. The patient may have it before, before their family or their family before the patient. And so they developed this work in 65. It's called Awareness of Dying. It's a famous book. It's very well worth reading, um, uh, explaining. It's the very first grounded theory. And they had this early hunch. I won't go through the whole thing, but what they did was they realized that at a certain point in hospitals, people's expectations change. OK, and so nursing staff may be the first because they're dealing with patients on a much more day to day detailed basis than perhaps the doctors who only come in at certain times. And so nursing staff and care staff often became very aware this patient isn't going to get better. This patient is actually maybe they're elderly, maybe they're in a they're in a very bad medical state. Uh, and so they talked about this idea of awareness, how people became aware. And they looked at it in terms of um, geriatrics, so elderly people. They looked at it in, merge, in emergency rooms and they even went to um, places where children were unfortunately going to die because of some child illness or, or accident or trauma. And so they came up with this idea of awareness contexts. So they came up with this idea of closed awareness, where a group are aware, but they don't tell others. Suspicion, okay? So maybe the family or the patient thinks, I don't think they're treating me to get better. I think they've given up on me, okay? Mutual deception. Um, I've had this just a few years ago with a friend of mine of my age who, who developed um, a cancer. And we would sit and we would chat and he would tell me his treatments and we'd talk about all the things he would be doing next year when we would go out for walks in the Yorkshire Dales around Leeds and so on. We both knew that wasn't, I think, was very highly unlikely or almost certainly was not going to happen. So this was the, the, the early work that Glazer and Strauss did. And their backgrounds um, were very different. Um, as you see, Glazer was younger than Strauss. Um, and Strauss, when he moved from Chicago, the University of Chicago, to California, um, University of California, San Francisco, was already a well-established um, researcher, um, teacher, and author. Um, he'd worked, in fact, on a very famous study with his colleagues in um, uh, in Chicago called Boys in White in the 1950s. Now we're in the 1950s, so you know, largely boys became doctors, girls, they only were allowed to become nurses, okay? Uh, and clearly what Strauss realized, and he, there's a little footnote in Awareness of Dying, which says, if you look at Boys in White, we, we, we now understand that when these people were having their medical training, no one ever taught them how to deal with patients who don't get better and die. Okay, so this was a, a, an interesting point. So Strauss was already a, a, a well-recognized uh, researcher. In fact, he was drawn to move from Chicago to California by somebody who said, you know, I'm going to give you your own department of what we would now call sociology of health or sociology of medicine. Um, 
not surprisingly, after two or three years, they, the money wasn't there, so he never did get it. His, his, he had his position and his group, but he didn't have a department. Glazer is a bit younger. Um, he also uh, um, was involved, did, did uh, his um, army service for a while, so he was a mature student, but he eventually went to the, to the University of Columbia, which is in New York, um, where he was influenced by Paul Lazarsfeld, who was a um, sociologist who had come from uh, Germany and Austria in the, in the 30s um, and was very much a founding figure on social research methods. And also um, uh, Robert Merton, who was, as we'll see, was uh, an important character. So Strauss comes from a more sort of interactionist, in, uh, um, symbolic interactionist, constructivist type background, Glazer from a slightly more hard social science type background. And they produce these early texts. Um, and these are the core texts. Awareness of Dying, which came out in 65. There were some articles in the early couple of years before. Discovery of Grounded Theory, which is a book that everybody quotes from or references, but not everybody, I think, reads. And I don't think you should, you should, you need read it as a student. Time for Dying, which was based on the same data as Awareness of Dying, um, but came out a few years later. And Status Passage. And those, there were other books but they, this was most of the work they did jointly in, in the 60s and 70s. And the key features of this method were that they challenged the orthodoxy of the time. United States social sciences in, in the 50s and 60s, um, this was what the orthodoxy was. You know, qualitative studies were second rate. Well, you might do them in pre preparation for quantitative work. They were less legitimate because they weren't scientific. They didn't have the numbers in. They often were unsystematic and impressionistic, the things that editors still associate some grounded theory with. There was this division between theory and research. Theory was the, the stuff that was already out there, and you as a research student were there to sort of play around with certain parts of it. You went off and collected your data and then did all your analysis. They were two separate activities, one after the other, um, and you were unlikely to develop theory. So Glazer and Strauss challenged all of those points that are on that slide. And that what they wanted to do was to offer an alternative basis. Um, now, I think if you sort of push Glazer at various points, and I have met him and spoke to him several times, he would probably say, well, actually, ground theory is really the only good way to do research. But I think they were really saying, look, here is an alternative. And they were particularly keen for early career and doctoral researchers to feel confident that they could develop their own theoretical insights, okay? So discovery of grounded theory, which as you saw comes between awareness, the first of their grounded theories and the time for dying based on the same data, okay? But the second theory comes in 67 and it was a challenge to their peers in the academic world. It was really a manifesto. Um, and if you look at discovery ground theory, you'll see in several places, they're quite rude about some of the key figures in American social science at the time, including Merton, who had been Glazer's uh, supervisor, although they clearly didn't have a very close relationship, um, and a few other people um, who they're critical of. Although they do also use Merton's work in another way, uh, as, I'll, as we'll see later on. And what they really wanted to do was to give graduate students confidence they wanted them to say develop your own ideas don't worry what these existing theories say look at what's what you surround you and develop your own work okay and they have these statements in in the uh, discovery book so here's the, the classic one many of our teachers converted departments of soci sociology into mere repositories of great man theories. And they were all men, the men, the big theorists. The main one was the one that's mentioned there, talk at Parsons, who was the sort of founding father of social sciences in America. And they called these, these great, mat, great men were theoretical capitalists and the research students were proletarian testers, okay? Um, so what they're doing, what we're trying to do in this book is to strengthen the mandate for generating theory. Okay, so we're trying to say to people, you develop your own theories in your PhDs, okay, and you, you shouldn't be there verifying, okay, the work of the grand theorists. Okay, if you really want to insult a grounded theorist, 
accuse them of just being ver a verifier. Um, see what they say. They won't be too happy. Um, okay. So they therefore had was, were, were talking about these alternative starting points. So on the left hand side is the, the fairly classical hypothetic, hypothetical deductive approach. You look at somebody's work or some th body of theory, you deduce a hypothesis. You know, if this theory is right, then this thing should occur. I'm going to go and measure if that occurs. And if it does, then I've verified the theory. Okay. So you look at the key figures, you do a big literature review, you look at the look at particular theories um, and you create hypotheses which you go and test okay but on the other side is the alternative sketched out um, which Glazer and Strauss were talking about listen to what people say observe what they do which may not be the same and build on these sources of data so this is your work grounded in the data so it's much more a bottom-up while the one on the left hand side is a sort of a, a top-down approach The strange thing is that more than 50 years later, this challenge to orthodoxy is still seen as a challenge to orthodoxy. Um, and uh, just um, uh, last year, uh, I wrote a paper which talked about these continual permutations of misunderstanding. People still misunderstand grounded theory. Um, and I've had editors uh, and research um, committee chairs and people say to me, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm really a quants person. I, I understand there could be some qualitative stuff, but, you know, this grounded theory, uh, I don't really understand it, but I really don't think that it contributes very much. And you have to battle against that, as I say, particularly since it's such a widely used method. Okay, here's a very wordy slide. I'm not going to go through it all, but the bits in, in bold, I will go, I will take out. So this is the definition of what this method is. Okay systematic inductive and comparative for constructing theory persistent interaction emerging analysis that goes on simultaneously with collection and iterative okay so the first thing is that the method is seen as systematic it's not just oh i'll go out i'll listen to a few people and make up a few ideas you have to do it systematically you've got to keep your data you've got to gather your data you've got to investigate and analyze it it's inductive, so it's going from the bottom up, okay, as opposed to the deductive approach, which they were criticizing. And it's comparative. You can keep comparing things. The original, one of the original names for the grounded theory was the method of constant comparison. You know, as you keep comparing, initially you get codes and you compare those, and then you develop categories and you, do, you compare those and you compare. So you're constantly comparing things. And then you even compare it with aspects of the literature, as we'll see. Okay, and you're doing it to construct your own theory or model or framework. I use the terms uh, more or less to mean the same thing. I know there are people um, much more learned than I in philosophy of science who says there's a difference between a model and a theory and a framework. But essentially, you're trying to develop your own insights as a, as a PhD student, as an early career researcher, as a group of researchers. Okay. Yeah. And you are consistently and persistently interacting with your data. Um, Barney Glazer has come up with this idea that he's against the idea of research as speculative. It's not guesswork, which he calls immaculate conceptualization. It's grounded in the data. You know, if somebody says to you, well, where did that idea came from? You can point to the parts of the data where you got that from. Okay. So that's why this idea of being grounded in the data is so important. And this idea is that data collection and, and analysis proceed simultaneously or they're interwoven at the same time. Okay? You don't just go out into the field and collect your data and then come back and sit down in your, in your office and, and work through it. You're doing the two things influenced one by the other. So it's this idea of an iterative process. But it's not, you don't keep going round and round, you're actually developing your ideas to higher levels of uh, abstraction or concepts or theories. Okay. So here is a model, this is actually from Kathy Sharmaz's work, um, where you see this initial, initial idea at the bottom is a research question, there's some sampling, you do some initial data, some coding, 
and categorizing and theory building, but then these go round and round. You're actually doing round. And along the, uh, the left-hand side here, you've got this idea of memo writing. Okay? And then at the top is writing up and dissemination, spreading your ideas. Okay? Glazer was, is, is adamant that research only counts as research if you publish it. If you do research and you just sit on, sit on it and never publish it, he's not very impressed. Um, he thinks PhDs are very important, but you then have to publish at the same time or later on. Okay, now one of the aspects of um, grounded theory is this idea of coding. Um, and it's an idea which now lots of other methods use, having built on what grounded theory was um, telling them to do. So the first thing is grounded theory doesn't invent coding. Coding existed before, but grounded theory takes a very different view of it. Grounded theory method is not just coding and then saying, here's my coding, isn't this wonderful? But there are some publications which, you know, and I think editors have got a point, and they say, you know, oh, yes, we had this paper on grounded theory, and it just had loads of codes, and we didn't see how they all fitted together. Okay. So the idea was that, uh, and I mentioned before, Glazer's influence, because he was taught by this man, Paul Lazarsfeld, and Paul Lazarsfeld and his uh, colleagues in Austria in the 1920s and early 30s, um, they did a huge um, study of an Austrian town called Marienthal, where there was about six of them, including his wife, and they went out and they lived in the, in the town, they gathered data, they had coding sheets where they ticked things off and wrote things down. They had so much data that he actually, put, Lazarsfeld actually said, he felt they should weigh the data, you know, weigh the sheets of paper, uh, rather than analyze it because there was so much. Um, and in some of his writings at the time, and he then moves to America, uh, he's clearly saying, I'm not sure this is a very good way of doing research. Now, I don't know whether he influenced Glazer. Glazer certainly acknowledges Lattisfeld as, as one of his early influences, but certainly Glazer and Strauss, when they got together, said, why go out into the field and do your research with everything already coded up? Why not go out with a blank sheet of paper, maybe some general questions, and look at what the data is telling you after you've collected some of it? So this was a unique and, and completely new way of doing things. Um, and lots of methods now um, in the qualitative uh, field uh, now use this approach. Not all of them actually give credit to Glazer and Strauss, but that's where it came from. It came from Glazer and Strauss in the 60s. Okay. So, Here's an example of coding, okay? So here are some data on the left-hand side from three different interviews, okay? And the initial thing you do with coding is you look at what it's telling you and you take some of the ideas. And my students sometimes come to me. First of all, they're very suspicious when I say, you know, don't have research questions, just go out and interview some people, see what they tell you. And they think, well, how will I know they're gonna tell me anything important? Or if I do three or four interviews, they might tell me completely different things. How do I know this is going to help? And I say, well, just try it, just see. And then they come back and they say, oh, I've done some coding. Is it correct? They don't always say this because they actually know it's not a good question to ask because coding is never correct or incorrect. It's, is, is it useful? Is it effective? Okay. If I look at, at this data, I may come up with the codes on the right hand side. You may look at it and come up with some similar ones or very different ones. And it's really a case of where you take that data to. Okay. I've already mentioned Glazer and Strauss used the same data for their book in 65 on awareness and their book in 68 on time. So there they actually said, this data is going in two different directions, but we're going to do one of them now and then put the other one to the side. And here's another example. This is actually not from an interview. This is from a, uh, a story in a newspaper a few years ago, which I use with some of my uh, students and that way if I do workshops, uh, you know, half-day workshops on grounding theory to get people into coding. Um, and again, I've picked up six things in this, in this thing. Often when I give out just the text on the left-hand side, the data, and get people to do their own codes, some of them come out with similar things, some of them come out with, with very different things. So the sorts of things that Glazer and Strauss were suggesting is instead of going out to do your research with a research question, and perhaps a set of you know questions from a sort of a questionnaire or survey type thing you go into a context and you say what's going on what are people doing what are people saying 
What are they taking for granted and not saying? That can be very important. Um, how to structure and context. We're in a social setting here. What's going on? So these are very general questions, okay, that they were saying to do. And in this open coding, they were actually saying to people, be prepared to be surprised. And I must tell you, whenever I examine somebody's PhD who isn't my student, or if I'm preparing one of my students for their, their um, Viva examination, I always say to them, what surprised you in the years, three, four years of your doing this research? I've never yet had someone saying, oh, nothing surprised me, it all worked according to plan. Um, if they ever do say that, I'll be very suspicious because think they haven't actually done any research. Okay, you let the respondents talk. Okay, half the things they tell you may not be interest, but you don't know which half. So you go in with an open-ended question, and you let them talk. Okay, and often it's surprising. People think to me, "Oh, I'm not sure people will talk to me. I'm not sure they'll say very much." Normally, they come back saying, "You know, I thought I was going to be there for 40 minutes. After an hour and 10 minutes, I was having to sort of, you know, think <laughs> I need to put an end to this this uh, interview or this conversation." Glazer's advice is for grand theory is avoid preconceptions. Now, the reason he says this is because he wants you to be prepared to be surprised. But in order, you know, to avoid preconceptions, none of us can do that. None of us know what our preconceptions actually are. Okay. Yep. And the saying that's often quoted, often by this guy Ian Day, although it's also, I think, been said by by this man Edward Tufty, is an open mind is not the same as an empty head. So often the reason people do research is because they're interested in the topic. They may have studied it as a, an undergraduate or master student. So to say, avoid preconceptions, you're saying, well, you can't do that. And the reason you, know, you wanted to do this research was you had some, you had some ideas, but you need to be prepared to say, I, I need to put, put those aside at least, or be prepared to be surprised. And it's usually assumed that grounded theory requires face-to-face -face interviews, or I've just been doing one study and I'm starting another one, um, which in the nature of the pandemic, I'm having to use various things like Zoom or Teams or, or whatever. Um, but you're usually doing interviews one-to-one, -one, okay? But um, Glazer's idea that all is data means you can use focus groups, you can look at literature, you can video, all sorts of things. Anything can be data as far as grounded theory is concerned. But just a point about interviews, and I always think it's important to say this, I think a lot of you, if you're at an event like this, may be using interviews or planning to use interviews. Um, one of the best, and it may be you know about this, um, the person who writes really very well and edits a whole collect series of, of very good collections in, in England, is this man David Silverman um, and he's got this very important paper from 2017 how was it for you which actually refers to an earlier paper of his it's a very very clever and incisive paper on how people use interviews everyone seems to sort of say oh I'm going to use interviews but they use them badly they analyze them poorly and so on um, there's also this sage handbook uh, of interview research and particularly chapter 32 by Kathy Sharmaz on qualitative interviewing and grounded theory analysis. Very important if you're doing interviews as part of your work, even if you're not using grounded theory, that you have a look at some of, of those um, sources. So I mentioned sampling. Um, the sampling in grounded theory is initially purposive. I need to, to talk to these people because, well, because that's the area I'm interested in. Okay. It may be convenience as well. And why have you chosen those people? Well, because I have access to them. And it may be snowball sampling because they will then tell me about a few other people that I can contact. And it's very important, as I say, that you make it clear it's not probabilistic sampling. And you make that clear to your examiners, you make it clear to editors of journals, uh, because I've seen, you know, um, PhD students go for their examination and the person says, you know, your sample is very small and why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? Um, so you have to say, I'm not in the quantitative, statistical, probabilistic sample. So you start gathering data. And as I said before, you let people talk. So this is saying it's driven by the informants. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they, Glazer and Strauss, sampled those in specific departments through Quint, who was the person who 
gathered a lot of their data. They didn't gather a lot of it. It was gathered by Gene Quint. And then you start making comparisons. You compare different people. What do they say? How do they differ? How does this bit of data compare with the other? Is it, are they saying the same thing? Often, if you do your third or fourth interview, um, you start to say, oh, there's something come up in this interview. I think it came up in interview one and I missed that. I better go back. And, so you're constantly going around to do this constant comparison. Okay. Yeah. And while you're doing that, you're writing memos. Well, you should be writing memos. And even if you're not using graphic theory, memos are a really good way of developing your work and recording your work. Okay. And you write them to yourself. So my students write memos and occasionally they'll say, I'd like to show you in one of my memos. Okay. But most of them are memos in maybe in their own language. A lot of my PhD students do not have English as their first language. They write memos in their in their first language. They may be in note form. They may have diagrams. In fact, increasingly, with people having access to computer uh, facilities and computer software, they have diagrams as well as as um, uh, comments and so on. Okay. But here is the quote from Sharmaz. Memo writing is a crucial method in grounded theory. It prompts you to analyze your codes, data and codes early in the research process. Okay, And it's really important when you write memos, you do them at the time and you date them. Because two years down the line, as you're preparing your draft for your PhD, you can go back and look at what you were writing. You're not, trying, you're not making it up. Okay, If any of us thinks, oh, this is what I thought I was doing last month or last year or at the beginning of the pandemic and so on, probably not going to be accurate. If we go back and look at any notes we made at the time, they may actually be quite surprising. Okay. Yeah. And here, writing successive memos keeps researchers involved in the analysis. You're not just writing down, all right, this is what I did today. You're writing some thoughts. So you're continuing and developing your analysis. Okay. Now, if you look at the early writings that I mentioned, those ones from the 60s, memo writing doesn't exist. It's not mentioned. The only thing that's referred to are things called field notes, um, which were basically, you know, when you went out into the field, to the hospital setting or the, uh, the nursing center or the school or wherever, you, you made notes, field notes, a bit like a, an anthropologist or a, an ethnographer. Okay? But memos become more important than that. And it's only in the 80s and 90s that it's become a really key part of the method. So the method has changed and developed in, in, in the time since it was developed in the 60s, which would be very surprising if it hadn't. Okay. And as I say, memo writing is a good, is good practice. It's reflective. It gets people to reflect on their ideas. So even if you're not using grand theory, it's a great thing to write about what's happened and what you think has happened and why it was important. Okay. And initially, they can be fairly free form. Some later memos um, are much more formal in many respects. And you may see, if you look at a lot of PhDs um, and even journal papers that, uh, where granite theory is being used, um, the researchers actually you know, refer to their memos. They either quote an entire memo, or they even sometimes put in a, 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 an image of their, their memo um, to show what they were thinking. Okay? But some of them are very private and they won't be worth that. And what I found is that the early memos of, of students are very much them sort of thinking, am I doing this method right? Is this the right way to do it? You know, is it going to work? Okay. Once they get over that, their later memos, they've forgotten all of that and it's all about their data and their concepts, you know, developing this concept and so on. Okay. Uh, in one of my books, I actually use memos from several of my PhD students. And in one case, I think I use one student and I show his, his memo in about six different versions. Where the first version is, am I doing this right? Here's what Sharmaz says you should do, blah, blah, blah. By the time he gets to version six, it's about a five page. I don't put all five pages in the book. I just put an extract um, where uh, he's actually saying, this is my data. This is now what I think I've got for my grounded theory. And one of the things that Glazer says, and Kathy Sharma says, um, I'm never quite convinced about this, um, is that you can actually um, use your memos, and then when it gets to publishing, you can put them in a sequence and sort them, and it will then give you a structure for your PhD thesis or your, or your paper submission. Um, 
it doesn't work for me, it may work for, for other people. But what we're doing in grounding theory then is the following. Essentially, you're looking at your data. Let's assume you've got some data interview transcriptions, you may have some documents, you may have looked at some archives uh, or whatever, and you do some coding, the sorts of things I was showing you back in that previous slide. And they're all over the place. In fact, sometimes people end up with hundreds of codes and they really don't know quite what to do. But what they then find is they can group them in some way. Okay, and they might use all the codes. As you'll see here, there are some codes which are not uh, part of the, um, uh, th those three groupings, but they find they can group them into three different categories. Okay, right. And those categories, they can then start talking about those categories without having constantly to refer to the detail of the codes. Okay, so you can imagine maybe one of those, if Glazer and Strauss were there, were saying, you know, well, we've done this coding and there is this thing where people seem to be saying, they're aware of somebody dying, but the other person isn't, or et cetera, et cetera. So we've, we've got a, a thing now called awareness, and we can see it has different properties. Okay, yeah. So you've moved it up a level from these impressionistic account just of all the data here. Okay, and once you've gem generated some code, you move on to another form of sampling, which Glazer and Strauss talk about, which is called theoretical sampling. So you're now not going in just to a context, you're now saying, wait a second, we now think there is this thing called awareness, and we may have measured, we may have come across it after looking at um, uh, people in a ward where there are elderly people who come in, um, who are statistically more likely to die than younger people. But I wonder if the same thing happens in wards where people come in with acute illnesses, or people come in from accident and trauma. Okay. So we now know what it is we're looking for. So we're now sampling on the basis of our developing theory. So the term theoretical sampling is the one that is then used in later stages of um, a grounded theory piece of research. While I'm talking about these terms, let me just say that a lot of the definitions that I use in my slides, um, um, in the very nice introduction, they mentioned the, the two handbooks that Kathy Sharmat and I uh, co-edited the handbook of grounded theory 2007 and the one in 2019 on current developments they both have what i put in or i actually use kathy sharma's work as a basis for a lot of it um, a discursive glossary so all the terms i'm using theoretical sampling focus coding theoretical saturation so you will find entries for them in that discursive glossary so if you need a good quote to say this is what i take this term to mean go and look at the, the handbooks. Your libraries should have them. I'm not suggesting you buy them because they're sort of big, hard, hardback and very expensive. So theoretical sampling is what you're doing. And then, they, then you're trying to focus your coding. You're trying to say, we're not just taking any old data now. We're now, we now have a focus. Now, of course, if you have a focus, it means you have to focus on certain things and ignore others. And that's fine. And I always say Glazer and Strauss did that because they wrote awareness and three years later, they wrote time for dying they actually had written similar papers at the same time but they hadn't worked the whole thing out okay and theoretical sampling is specific to grounded theory okay it tells you where your what your further data collection should consist of okay and you begin to, to to feel more confident that what you've got is something that is actually in the data and that you can justify and that you can write about not just in a sort of an impressionistic way oh these people said these things you're now beginning to say a bit more than that okay so considerably more than that okay and so you may then choose just one of these categories okay and again i have phd students that to me oh I'm, i've done this and i've got this and i've you know and i've got this these two or three possibilities i can't do all of them what should i do okay and i say well you come up with a reasonable justification to explain why the one or the two are more important or more important for you at this stage and you say the others are important but i can't look at those now so i'm going to focus on this this particular one okay and you then do your focus coding and your theoretical sampling so you've got here some initial um data points if you like from your earlier work and what you do is you add some more okay and you do some more because you're now focusing in that area you're asking much more directed questions you're trying to get some justification for the, the abstraction, the concept, the theory that you are, are developing. Okay. Yeah. And 
as you're doing this, don't lose sight of what's going on. You're trying to move from a lot of codes to what I see as, an, as a clear one or two levels of concept. Okay. Yeah. Now, some of the people like Sharmaz and in fact, like Glazer, they say you go from cones to concepts to category. Okay. I don't like that because I don't think categories do very much. They just group things together, but concepts have explanation. Okay. And in fact, both Glazer and Sharmaz and Strauss talk about grounded theory as a form of conceptualization. Okay, so I like this idea of moving to a concept or a set of concepts. Yeah, so you therefore might take two of these and move them up to a higher level of abstraction and then start to explain that. Okay, okay, so here's an example. I'll give you an example. This is uh, from my book in 2017. It actually relates to a workshop which a colleague and I had held in uh, Amsterdam, I think two or three years earlier, with a group of our PhD students. I taught in Amsterdam as well as in Leeds, um, and I took, I think, two or three of my PhD students, and then they were a group in, 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 in the Netherlands. Uh, and for two days, they all had a chance for an hour to talk about their research and have question and answer and so on and so forth. Um, and I did a quick bit of data gathering, as they said things, and I came up with the model of what I call research pitching. Okay, they were pitching their research a bit like you know somebody pitching their ideas to um, uh, you know a, um, a venture capitalist or a, a research committee or whatever. Um, and I came up with a certain level of, of um, categories or concepts that were associated with it. They talked about a research journey. They talked about being immersed, getting into their research. Um, they talked about their motivation. Again, something which a lot of researchers are told not to talk about, but I think is really important. Why are you interested in that research? Well, it affected my family. Glazer and Strauss it affected their, you know, their parents. They took ownership of their, they, took, they kept talking about my PhD. Okay, yep. And then there were a couple of things which I'd put up in slightly different arrows, which I thought were quite important. I should actually have taken these on further and I haven't, um, uh, which I thought were in themselves could have been a, a grounded theory. So here we are, you know, my PhD. Okay. This was, you know, this was not just a piece of work. This was something they felt personally about. A lot of them were part-time researchers. They were working full time and doing the research as, as a sort of a, an add-on. So they were clearly motivated to do it in. Okay. They talked about this idea of a journey. Okay. And then I had these two categories, modeling and sensitizing and desensitizing. Um, so that some people are talking about being sensitized to, to certain aspects as they did their research. You know, as I said, oh, we're focusing on things. Others said, oh, we did this research and we realized we'd been ignoring all the things. We were desensitized, which clearly are, are related. So, I, you know, these could have become um, grounded theories in their own right. Okay. But having said this, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I will go and take that work up. Now, where do grounded theories come from? Well, here we get to a... Uh, a classic issue in grounded theory. Glazer and Strauss, and Glazer in his writings, he's been he's not that well at the moment, but he's been publishing and writing all the way up until certainly early last year. Um, keep talking about theories emerging from the data. Um, Glazer continues to do it. Strauss, who then later worked with, with Julie Corbin, continue to use that phrase. Okay. And it was the the basic um, term people use. I still have people who say, oh yes, my theories emerged from the data. And I always say, so you didn't do any work then. And of course they look at me and go, no, of course I did. So I said, well, you know, this idea of them emerging magically is, is a little bit misleading. Um, and in fact, Glazer and Strauss in the 90s diverge. Or rather, Strauss goes off in one area and Glazer attacks him. Okay. So Glazer, Strauss in 1990, uh, produces a book called Basics of Qualitative Research with Julie Corbin, um, which is now in its fourth edition. He's a, they write the first edition in 1990. In 1996, um, Strauss actually dies, but in 98, a second edition comes out. And then in, in, since, since 2000, there have been a third and a fourth edition, Corbin and Strauss, because obviously Julie Corbin is around. And Glazer didn't like that book for a whole variety of reasons. And so in 1992, he covers, he covers his own book called Basics, but it's not Basics of Qualitative Research, it's Basics of Grounded Theory. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, in, in what happened. But the important thing that happens in the 90s 
is that Kathy Sharmaz writes, begins to start writing her work. Now, Kathy Sharmaz, who unfortunately died um, just around this time last year, um, was amongst the first group of PhD students at the University of California, San Francisco. So Strauss and Glazer get money to set up a research project in University of California, San Francisco. They set up a PhD program, um, and Kathy Sharmaz is one of that first group. Not all of that first group, uh, or even in later years, not all of them do use grounded theory because they find it quite difficult. Um, but Kathy Sharmaz is one of that group, um, and her PhD is this term super normalizing, um, which I'll explain very briefly. Uh, what she found was that um, she investigated a group of um, middle-aged men in America who'd had heart attacks. Usually they had heart attacks because they drank too much, ate too much fat, didn't do enough exercise, etc., etc. too much alcohol, um, uh, sugars and so on. So they, they have a heart attack, they recover, they're told to take more exercise and, and you know, a better diet. And what they do is they start not just doing a bit more, you know, a bit of walking or, or cycling or something. They take up marathon running and racquetball and mountaineering and all sorts of things to show that they're not just normal, they're even better. So they're super normal. And of course, quite often uh, a second and then often a third and fatal heart attack comes. Um, and what she found was, of course, that you can, the same thing applies to athletes. You know, lots of footballers, particularly, I'm just thinking since, um, uh, I know Turkey didn't do that well in it, and England are still in with a big game this evening. But a lot of footballers who have an injury, they come back and they say, yeah, I'm really, I'm good again, I'm blah, 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 blah. And then they have a second and third injury. Okay, and there are several I can think of in that category. So super normalizing was her PhD, um, a very important concept. Uh, when Barney Glazer turned 80, and I think he's now in his early 90s, so it's over 10 years ago, I remember I rang him up and congratulated him and asked him how he was, and he said, I'm fine, I'm super normalizing. So now, Kathy Sharma is, is important because she writes um, in the 90s uh, about this idea of constructivist grounded theory. Um, and it's in the second edition of this handbook on qualitative research, second edition in the year 2000. In 1994, the first edition, there'd been a chapter on grounded theory written by Strauss and Corbyn. And in the years since, I think there's now a fifth edition, it's, it's mostly been Kathy Sharman's. And then in, 19, in 2006, she produces this book called Constructing Grounded Theory. Okay, so Glazer and Strauss, it's the discovery. Hey, there's grounded theory, it's always been there. Okay, and Kathy Sharman says, no, no, constructing. Researchers are acting as constructivists, as interpretivists. Okay, now at around the same time as she writes the article in the handbook, I completely unbeknown, and I don't have anything like her background in, in uh, grounded theory, I had finally had a student who had come along with a grounded theory proposal. And I'd said, I'm not sure this is really a very good preparation. And he'd said, no, it persevered. I'd read some of Glazer and Strauss um, and realized it was actually a very interesting method but there were some real problems with the use of ideas of data so i'd written i'd done a conference paper and then eventually this journal paper um and then i realized i'd come across this work from kathy Sharmaz and i'd contacted her um and glazer then wrote this rather uh, strange slightly rude but if you know barney glazer it's in his in his style uh, an attack on on Sharmaz's chapter and when I pointed it out to Kathy Sharmaz and said, you should really respond, she said, well, that's very difficult because he was initially one of my PhD supervisors and teachers. Um, I don't think I can do that. And so I said, well, I, could I do it? And she said, yes. Um, and that was 2003. And then we began to put together this idea eventually for the handbook of people looking at grand theory in different ways, um, which came out in 2007, uh, which has a fantastic range of authors. Um, and the reason we got such a fantastic range of authors is because Kathy Sharmaz's name was there. Um, and people were saying, if Kathy Sharmaz is one of the senior editors or is one of the editors, then I, I'm, I'm going to contribute. Um, and we got Glazer to do to contribute as well. So we had a, a pretty good range of grounded theory people. Constructive as a grounded theory is the key innovation I put since 2000. Kathy was already writing about this in the in the 1990s. 
um, it engages with the sorts of debates about data and interpretivism and constructivism, which had been around, in fact, since the 60s, when Glazer and Strauss are writing, but they don't take them into account in their, in their work. Um, it gives people guidelines of how people construct the phenomenon that they're particularly studying, and it moves the method into the interpretative approach. It, 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 you know, Kathy Chalmers was, was much too modest, but you know, what Kathy really did was by writing Constructing Grounded Theory and the work that led up to it, she was giving grounded theory a basis which it didn't have before. And it probably would have just begun to die out um, if, if she hadn't come along and done that. Okay. Yeah. So the knowledge is the way in which people construct their situated knowledge. Okay. And my view is, and it's the, it's the, you know, the metaphor Glazer and Strauss is this is idea of the, the, the grounded theory emerges from the data, you know, almost like a sort of a, a monster coming up from a, from the, 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 the earth. Okay. And I say, no, actually it's not discovery. It's dialogue and interpretation. You as a grounded theory researcher, but almost any researcher, but certainly in qualitative work, but certainly in grounded theory, you are in dialogue with your data. Now that dialogue may actually be dialogue because you may be talking to people in your interviews, or I often call them conversations. I don't like interviews because it sounds as though I'm the interviewer expert and you're answering my questions, or actually I'm here to find out from you as a participant. Okay, but I may also be in dialogue with some websites, with some archives, with some, you know, so but this idea of dialogue, I think is a much better term than this idea of a theory emerging from the data. So the constructivist or constructionist, the two terms are the same. Um, we stress flexibility. We don't lay down how you should do your coding. Okay. Glazer in his attack on, on Strauss and Corbyn was quite justified in some respects to saying you're telling them a very formal way of doing coding and that's not the way grounded theory works. Okay. In fact, both Kathy and I on our separate, you know, we would give lectures and things and people would say, oh yes, you're attacking some of the ideas of Glazer. So you favor Strauss and Corbyn's approach. And we go, no, actually, we've got more in common with Glazer's ideas than with some of the ones in Strauss and Corbyn. And we ask additional questions, as we'll see. Okay. But what we do say is that um, Glazer's idea of all is data is fine. Glazer and some of his people who come up, come with him, say, but data is everything. And we say, no, it's not. There's a lot much more going on. Okay. And we think this idea of emergence is an unfortunate one. Okay. So we've then got different approaches to, to the method. We've got the basic texts from Glazer and Strauss. And from there, we've got Strauss and then Strauss and Corbyn with their work. Now Strauss goes off and teaches in Germany for a while, and the German tradition is a very different tradition, very well represented in, in the two handbooks, um, which you'll see. Um, Glazer then has been doing his own thing since the 90s. Glazer actually works with Strauss at the University of California, San Francisco for a few years, not very long. He's really there on a sort of funded post. And when the funding stops, he goes off, okay? Um, uh, he makes money in, in real estate in California, but he also does do some writing. And then since the, the 90s, he sets up his own publishing company, Sociology Press, and has been enormously supportive to a whole group of massive group of students since then. And then Kathy and my work from 2000 onwards. And there are other approaches as well. OK, so here's Strauss, who is the key figure. OK, his work in before the, the, the 60s is in Chicago. OK. He then, in the 80s, starts teaching grounded theory in England, in America and in Germany. And in Germany, he produces a set of notes that then becomes this book, Qualitative Analysis for Social Scientists. Okay. And then he updates this and adds in some extra work when he produces Julie, the work with Julie Corbyn. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, in his early work, this qualitative analysis for social scientists, he actually takes a whole chapter from Glazer's 1978 work on theoretical sensitivity, which is Glazer's best book in my opinion. Okay. And then in his later work, he takes some of that material and puts it into basics of qualitative research. Okay. And Glazer attacks that book. He doesn't attack the early book. Okay. In fact, if you look at basics of grounded theory, he actually says in the introduction, I tried to get Strauss 
to withdraw this book from publication, the, 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 the Strauss and Corbyn first edition. He's really annoyed by it. Okay. Yeah. Strauss never responded. You occasionally get people who say, oh, yes, Glazer and Strauss had this big argument about grounded theory. So, no, no, actually, Glazer had this <laughs> um, attack on Strauss. Strauss hardly says anything about it. It's a very few things he occasionally says. Okay. But he's already in the 1960s. Strauss is clearly beginning to say, Grand theory actually isn't an inductive method. We overplayed induction in our book Discovery. Okay, right. He actually says it's an abductive method. Now, I don't have time to go into what abduction is, but again, there are some very good chapters in the handbooks and lots of things being written. Um, and Kathy Sharmes always tells the story that in the 1960s, Strauss came over to her and said, it's an abductive method. We overplayed induction. But the term induction in discovery is, is never used on its own. It's called analytical induction, and that is very specific. Okay. So by the 90s, Strauss is already aware this method is good, but other people are taking it in different directions, and we can't stop them. Okay. Glazer gets really annoyed, and until recently was still very annoyed at people who did things in different directions with his method, as he saw it. Okay. What actually happened earlier this year um, from a group that, that got together in the uh, middle of last year was a group of us from different uh, camps, if you like, in Grandy Theory, got together and held a, a workshop across the day on the 12th of March. Um, so we had um, classic Grandy Theory, which is Glazer's term, given by one of his um, colleagues, constructivist Grandy Theory, which is Cathy's term, Situational analysis, which is Adele Clark. Now, Adele Clark is now retired as professor um, in the University of California, San Francisco, but she took the chair which Strauss originally had. She was one of the, uh, the students. We've got Jörg Strubing, who is talking about the German Straussian grounded theory, because Strauss taught there on his own without Glazer, without Corbin. Okay. And then two. Um, researchers and, and authors in, in Australia who talk about the Strauss and Corbin model. And we all got together and, you know, I did an overview on these different varieties, which is the uh, short book I published uh, a couple of years back. It was originally meant to be the introduction to um, the, uh, the, the second handbook, but it was got too long and became a publication on its own. And we're all talking to each other, okay? which is Terrific. Okay, all these different. We're not fighting each other and saying we're real granite theorists and you're not. We're actually sitting down and saying we do things differently, and this is what we do. So um, you can, I think, see some of the materials still online from that. But you'll see all the books are there uh, of people, uh, the different authors. Okay. So how do you know you've got a good grounded theory? Um, well, the grounded theory should fit with the setting from which it's been derived. It should have grab or resonance and it should work. So it should actually help in practice. Remember, I've already mentioned this. Okay. And it should be modifiable. These are all terms which Glazer and Strauss use in their early writings. They seem a bit vague. And at certain points when I wrote about them 20 odd years ago, I was a bit rude. So these are vague terms. How would you know what's going on? They're actually very good terms. Okay. Yeah. But they've actually been updated, I think, in a very good way by Kathy Sharma um, because she's used got similar ideas and these are her her four um terms and in fact i get my phd students to um uh think about these even if they're not doing grounded theory is your research credible is it believable okay you know have you suddenly said oh here here's my data oh and here's my findings and your examiners and readers are going to go how did you get from that to that okay is it original is there some insight there okay is it resonant you know, it does it look at the context and people go, yes, I can see how that really is drawn from that context and telling us something we didn't already know about. OK, one of my students had had her um, PhD viva just a couple of weeks ago and her examiner said, you know, I, I work in this field and you've told me something here which I'm going to use in my practice. So that's then the last point. Is it useful? OK, so these are all important aspects. OK, so use. Um, yeah. So is it useful? Does it work to contribute to knowledge and practice? And again, as I say, the early grounded theories on um, uh, um, sorry, on uh, awareness of dying, for instance, has been enormously useful in the whole practice uh, of terminal care. Okay. 
Uh, I've shown the book to all sorts of people, people who work in in uh, bereavement counselling, people who've lost parents or, or friends or whatever. They've all found it an enormously useful book. You know, so that's a really important point. So there are some examples of grounded theory, awareness of dying, time for dying, supernormalizing, research pitching. Okay? And I'm sure you can find others in the literature. There are lots of grounded theory um, PhDs out there. And just a few points to sort of close, and then I hope we'll have some time for questions. Um, there, they talk about substantive and formal theories. Okay? A substantive theory is a theory based in the area where you've done the research. So time for dying is about the fact that people come into hospital settings and they go through a series of stages, okay, a sequence, which is they come in, we treat you, ah, oh, you're not going to get better, we're going to try and deal with your pain, we're going to try and make, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Yeah. And a formal theory is at a higher level, okay? So one of the things that um, Glazer and Strauss write about in one of their early books is status passage. Now, status passage is a formal theory that takes the model from time for dying and uses it in other contexts, okay? People's careers, people's relationships, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you have a substantive theory and a formal theory. They are both what Merton, and this is where they do take up Merton uh, in a good way and not criticize, calls theories of the middle ground. They're not theories that explain everything because theories that explain everything, as far as a lot of people are concerned, don't explain anything. Okay, so you have a substantive theory, and then that can be develop into a formal theory. Okay. Using the literature, a big problem, because Glazer and Strauss, and Glazer continues to say, don't read the literature. Okay? Now, if you've been a PhD student and you've put in a, um, a research proposal, you will know that if you say, oh, I haven't read the literature, um, you will get a very strange look, I hope. <laughs> from your assessors, your evaluators, say, well, how do you know your research is going to be useful? Okay, yeah. You can't not look at the literature, you have to, okay? Yeah, it's just not possible. You have to do it, you have to do it, but you can say, I'm looking at the literature because I have this issue, and I just want to see what other people have said, but that's not what, I'm not going to be validating or verifying their work, okay? And so you then end up with two stages for using literature in grounded theory. Initially, you're saying, here's the context I'm doing my research in. Here's the sort of work that's been done already. Here's how I think my ideas may work, but they may take me in a different direction. Okay. Once you've done your research, you then go back to that literature, or you may go to a different literature to say, this is my model. How does it fit or not or challenge existing research? And I've had several students who've done their initial literature review, they've done their research, they've produced their model, and they then said, my model has taken me to a an area which isn't the area I thought I was starting with, so I need to look at a different literature, okay? And this is what's called the part of theoretical coding. This is putting your work back together, okay? Yeah. And this idea is you're saying, I've got my substantive model, and I now need to see how it fits together. And this is where we get a little bit of, of insight into the reason that Glazer and Strauss, or Glazer attacked Strauss and why Strauss and Glazer did what they did, I think. Okay? Um, and it's largely because this idea of theoretical coding, which comes at the end of your research, is actually saying, I've got this data, I've broken it up into codes to see how it all, all the different codes are, and now I can't fit it together again. Okay? So Strauss, Gave the, and Corbin came up with this idea, which they call the coding paradigm. They said this will help people put their work back together because Strauss himself was already aware there were people writing things with lots of codes, and they weren't putting them back into a, a theoretical model in any way. Okay, and Glazer attacked Strauss and Corbin and said this isn't allowing the, the theory to emerge. This is forcing it into a you know into a box. Okay, the interesting thing is, ten years before Strauss and Corbin write there work he writes theoretical sensitivity in which he uses these coding families essentially to help students do the same thing that strauss and corbin were doing so he's they're working in the same area okay yeah yeah strauss saw the problem as the tendency is to take a bit of data and translate translate it into a pricey in other words you're not actually adding anything and taking it to a higher level okay all right 
Yeah. Uh, and so they, they have this idea of a coding paradigm. And if you look at Strauss and Corbin's books, you'll see they give you, you know, here's how you should do it in terms of codes and, and concepts and conditions and so on and so forth. Okay? They're trying to help students. Okay. Glazer, in his early work, is, was trying to do the same thing. Okay. Right. Now, I've actually had a, probably 30 or 40 of my students have used, PA, who have used grounded theory. I've examined at least a, a similar number. Um, for some reason, students don't seem to have a, a problem doing that. Um, they did maybe in the in the 70s and 80s, but they don't seem to now. So it's it's you know, I think Glazer and uh, 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 Glazer and Strauss and Corbin were trying to deal with the same problem, okay? And Glazer had actually started it with his coding families, and some of you may have used some of those. Um, people don't seem to need them. My students I know come along and say, oh yes, I looked at the, at, at Glazer's coding families. Well, the six C's, you know, causes, conditions, et cetera, et cetera. That seems quite good, but actually it wasn't all that helpful. And the other ones, I couldn't see how they were useful. Okay. So I've had various PhD students. Um, they go to the literature at the end of their research and don't call it a second literature review. Okay. Because it, that will confuse your examiner and say, this is theoretical coding. I've got my model. I now want to see how it fits in with the theory. Okay. With the, with the literature. Okay. Yeah. And so finally, um, just a, a, uh, a few points about how um, the, the grounded theory works, how it works. Go in with an open mind, not an empty head. Watch, listen, ask, read, record, write. Don't rely on recordings. As you go through interviews and things, um, think about what you're being told as it happens and write notes afterwards. Be confident, develop your own code. Okay, don't ask your supervisor, you know, is this right? Because I won't interpret data for my students because I know it will be my interpretation and it's got to be their PhD. But you can exchange your work with other people. You can go and do workshops, find other people using grounded theory, go to grounded theory workshops. Um, identify your initial codes, group them into potential categories. However you do it, you might use some software. I haven't talked about the software that's available. Um, a lot of my students use software, a lot of them don't, they don't like it, they do other things. They stick post-it notes on walls and take photos. Write memos, okay? You have to keep writing memos. Um, uh, and aim to identify these things and bear these different forms of sampling in mind, okay? okay. So the generic features, and these are, this is my view, um, but I think they apply across. Simultaneous involvement in data collection and analysis, developing your analytic codes, not from preconceived hypotheses, okay? Memo writing, making comparisons, okay? Eventually this theoretical sampling, and you've got to be clear, your initial work is exploratory, and then you say, right, now I'm gonna do some theoretical sampling. I now know who I'm gonna approach, what I'm gonna ask. You may need to do a further ethical approval, let me warn you about that, okay? And using the literature at different stages. So things to do next. Um, well, if you haven't read Kathy Sharma's Constructing, do. 2006 was the first edition. There was a second enlarged edition in 2014. She wasn't all that happy with some aspects of that and was working on a third edition before she died. And she was ill for quite some time. Um, a third edition is gonna come out because she has, being Kathy, she'd already asked somebody to um, uh, revise it and put it out that I hope will be coming out soon. Do some coding. If you've never done any coding, try it. Talk to researchers who've used GTM. Read this book by Wurtz that's in the next slide, okay? And find out about some of these things, okay, if you're going to do it. Um, if your library has my book or you can get access to it, read particularly the chapter um, uh, 19, which is where four of my PhD students write about their experience of using grounded theory. I didn't edit it. I asked them to do it. They were terrific. And it's there in their words, okay, not mine. Um, and the key texts I think to think of are awareness and time for dying. Don't bother with discovery. Read the appendices in both of those books as they're very good. Read Kathy Sharmas's book. Have a look at the two handbooks because they're terrific, the, the people who we got to contribute. Um, my book, Varieties, uh, summarizes a lot of what's in that second handbook. Um, 
and and Kathy Sharma said she thought it was terrific and would save. She said it will save graduate students a lot of time if they read your book. Um, read Glazer's book on theoretical sensitivity, and then this last book by Wurtz and Sharma's is also one of it is very interesting because it's five different qualitative approaches, and um, Kathy Sharma they, they use the same data, and there's one from discourse analysis, one from grounded theory, and so on. It's a very very interesting book. Okay, I hope I've whetted your appetite. I can't take you any further. There are some questions. Um, so here's one from an anonymous attendee. I'll just go through this and then we'll see if we've got any more. Uh, what distinguishes it from other methods? Writing the notes here, open code to be resonant, being resonant, be the differences. Well, there's certainly the key aspects which grounded theory has. And as I've said, a lot of qualitative approaches now use terms from grounded theory, not always um, referencing it. Um, design-based research, well, uh, possibly, although design-based, I mean, action research is another example. Again, in the early, earlier handbook, there's a chapter by Bob Dick on action research and grounded theory. Action research, of course, is research to change things. Um, grounded theory is, a, is to develop insights. And what Bob Dick is saying, why can't the two go together? Something I haven't had a chance to talk about is the fact that Kathy Chalmers is uh, last 10 years of writing, she did a lot on social justice and grounded theory, in which what you're doing in grounded theory is you're giving voice to people who normally don't get a chance to be heard in a research. Okay, um, Okay. a question about theoretical saturation. Um, okay, good point. The, the question is from Amir, thanks for this. Is it the point that you collect more data, you don't create more categories and concepts? That don't that, that in that they fit into your already created work. Well, if you collect more data, you're always going to find more data tells you something new, something different. Okay. So when people say, "Oh, I've reached saturation because I got more data and it didn't tell me anything new," and I say, "No, that's nonsense." But if the new data comes and doesn't help you establish, further establish your categories, or it just establishes what you've already got, then you can say it's not telling me anything different. For my think about that diagram I had with my circles. It's not telling me anything about that circle, which I've decided is my research. It's maybe telling me about other things. Okay. Yeah. And again, it's very important you understand that. I give a, a sort of a slightly off, off, slightly strange example of theoretical saturation in my book. But a lot of people mistake theoretical saturation for data. They say the new data wasn't telling me anything new. And I say, well, then it must have been the same data because new data always tells you something new. It may not be something of interest to you at that point. Okay. Um, uh, okay, here's the one from Sumera. I'm a student doing grand theory, my culturally appropriate aggression theory. Um, because of the term culturally appropriate, my advisor wanted me to reach different cultural backgrounds. Um, my juries are quantitative researchers. Uh, yeah, I think you have a problem there. You need to explain clearly what your sampling is, um, why you chose seven cities and how, I mean, I have, I actually have had a student who did a piece of research. In fact, she's one of the people, um, Pramila, in, she's one of the four students who talks about her work in the book. She went off and did a piece of research in, um, uh, in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka, sorry, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and she did six um, case studies, if you like, six areas where she went. And she came back and she wasn't sure how to do her, use her data. So she came to me and we decided she could use granny theory. What she did was she looked at the data from one location and coded it and produced a model. And then she compared it with a second one. And I said, you may find the second one is completely different from the first, in which case we'll deal with that when we come to it. Or you may find there is some constant level of comparison. So needless to say, she found there was quite a lot in common. She then used that to code the, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So it may be that you want to choose one of your regions and do some analysis and then compare it with each of the next ones and see if you get something that is common. Okay. But you will need, if your juries are quantitative researchers, you will need to explain to them why you've done it that way and what your form of sampling is. Okay, I've got one from uh, AZ. Ace, I can't remember if I've mispronounced your name. Um, the biggest challenge is perhaps avoiding preconceptions. Well, you can't avoid preconceptions. Um, but the only people who can judge whether or not your preconceptions have, have biased your research are the people who read your research. Um, uh, 
so there are any strategies. You just have to be prepared to be surprised. Um, uh, and as I say, most of my students are. They come to me and they say, hey, this happened in my data. This person said this thing to me and I hadn't expected it. And then we sit down and we say, is this something that you should be looking at? Is this something which will take you in a different direction? You can't avoid preconceptions. You must have them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing your research. Um, there's also a point which is often grander theorists come along with their proposals and they say, I haven't read the literature uh, and I'm doing this research because no one's done this research before. And I always say, well, how do you know that if you haven't read the literature? And of course, these days with Google, um, you can almost always find something which has been done, which has been done before. Um, I've then got a couple in Turkish, which I'm afraid I can't Asia. OK, thanks, uh, which I can't answer. Um, those are the type questions. I don't know if there are facilities for people to um, turn on videos or to participate in some other way. Uh, I've given you an awful lot um, on granular theory in a very short space of time. There's no way, unfortunately, um, to go through everything. But I hope I've given you some uh, indications of how to, to look at the text and, and take things further. Fatih Bey, Türkçe soruları çevirip Tanya'ya sorabilir misiniz? Fatih Bey, görebiliyor musunuz? Question and answer bölümünü. Uh, Tony, hi, how are you? Hi, okay, I'm fine. <laughs> nice to meeting you again. And, and thank you very much for this inspiring presentation and organizing such a nice uh, workshops for our participants. Uh, our interpreter is going to uh, translate the question. Okay, please. Question and answer section, try to be Q and A. Yeah. Is he going to say it or type it? I can't. Okay, let me translate the the, the question in in English. Uh, okay. And uh, Dil Dilbert Polat, okay. she says. Thank you very much for uh, your nice presentation. Uh, when it comes to constructing grounded theory, it, it can be, does, does it have to be you know, transferable for other fields? Or is it just specific to some certain situation? Okay, that's a good question. Um, they, it can, be, I, I mentioned um, Kathy's work on supernormalizing, which I say was originally uh, in healthcare, because that's where her background was. Um, but I've seen it being used in people training athletes, um, particularly when they, you know, they have an injury, how they come back, how they set them levels rather than trying to, you know, jump straight back into things. So it can transfer. Um, but normally, normally, the, um, the, the transferability is within an area. So somebody will do some work in healthcare, and it will apply to other aspects of healthcare. Um, they will do things in terms of education and it will apply there. But, so there's no, you know, there's no sort of box that says it must only apply in an area, but often uh, it, certainly the initial application of transferability to practice will be within a particular discipline, which will be related to the original research. Okay. Uh, okay. Final question from Aysun. Aysun Cholat, and okay. thank you very much for uh, sharing your presentation with us. Uh, before the intervention of action research, uh, when when setting the when setting the situation, uh, 
can, can we use it before the uh, grounded theory or can or can we use these two together complement sorry which was the other form of research so, sorry you said another form of research i, I missed the action which, research which one action research action research action research oh sorry um yes you can as i say um Bob Dick in the early handbook does talk about the two. Uh, if you look at some of the chapters in the in the new handbook, there are people there working in the fields of social justice, um, working with disadvantaged groups and so on, who are action researchers would say they're using action research because they're actually going into a research field, they're talking to people, they're finding out what the issues are, and they're helping them change things. So, uh, and I say it, it, it comes from Kathy Sharma's because she, for the last 10 years of her work, she was writing about social justice and grounded theory. So they do fit very well together, I think. Yeah. Okay, I think we, yes, we have more question. No, no, that, that's all. And Aisha Kizilba, the one you had problem with pronouncing her name, Aisha Kizilba, the one who introduced yourself to the other participants. And Dilber Polacas, she's thanking again to, for your message and presentation. Uh, Tony, thank you very much again. And now we have a surprise for you. <laughs> we are going to give you another set of digital one. <laughs> uh, I hope you, you like it, and I'm sharing the screen. So uh, let me. Okay. 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 So here's the certification. Uh, the certification is uh, from uh, Ani Publishing Company, the organizer of Azure Congress. And this is for the certification and the donation goes to Turkey Foundation for Combating Erosion, Afforestation and Conservation Natural Assets. So this is our digital one. And I hope you like it. I think that's an excellent idea. I'm very impressed. I think it's a very clever thing to have done. Um, I think you're having a wonderful conference and I hope everything goes smoothly for the rest of it. It looks a, a wonderful program and thank you very much for inviting me to contribute. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you very much as well for sharing your nice uh, ideas and the, about in the ground theory, which is you know, the meter, most of the, you know, the Tur academicians in Turkey. And we would like to you know, see you again in the future conference. Thank you. I, cer I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you again for your nice little present interpretation. And it was very nice. And our participants like it, I believe. Good. I'm very pleased. And all the best for the rest of your conference. Thank you very much, Tony. Okay. And take okay. Care. Bye now.